All right, guys. Uh, thanks for joining us virtually today. Unfortunately, we couldn't do this one together as we usually do, but we definitely wanted to keep momentum and keep the group together and keep content going through the our current isolation situation. We have Aaron Ansari from from Trend Micro, the vice president of the Cloud One conformity uh, product that will be giving us a great talk today on the well-architected framework and Amazon security. So with that, I will hand it over to Mr. Ansari. Thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, Justin. Can you guys hear me all right? Yes. Good. One of the things I like to do as the interwebs are being stressed is on a conference call, I actually like to get the the phone the old-fashioned phone dial in rather than using my computer i probably should turn my camera off as well but i'm just too vain so we will go forward with this now just so everyone knows i did i do have breath mints so if you were here in front of me my breath would be fantastic and we could have a good a good um discussion without anybody even worried about about halitosis but um thanks everyone for for having me here i, I certainly appreciate your time um, what we're going to go through over the next, you know, half hour, 40 minutes or so is kind of a discussion of what we're seeing as it relates to two key things with AWS or within AWS, uh, I guess I'll say spiritually, um, and that's the the shared responsibility model and the well-architected framework. Two things that I that I would imagine from an audience perspective are, are something with which you're, you're quite familiar. Um, this is meant to be uh, a discussion, you know, user group discussions, meetups, they're not, they're not meant to be lectures, they're not meant to be formal. So please ask questions either in the chat window or just, you know, kind of chime up and say, hey, could you expound on that? Could you explain that? No, you're crazy. I don't know what you're talking about. You know, anything, anything that you want to say, please feel free to go through and, and um, discuss it as we're, as we're having this. So who am I? Um, I'm Aaron. I cut my teeth you know, a while ago, back in the 2000s from a technology standpoint, leading up to a lot of time in the financial services space, we kind of left the financial services space as the chief security architect of, of BMW Financial Services. So if you ever leased or purchased a vehicle through BMW, a BMW dealership and financed that vehicle through BMW Financial Services rather than JP Morgan Chase or, or some other bank, uh, your loan was in charge of of my applications and my systems, and so what I would, what I did there was heavily compliance focused, heavily audit focused, heavily technology focused on, you know, ensuring your your mobile payment app was secure and compliant, ensuring that any any financial audits or systems that we had to go through um, had to had to be certain to to get through, and acknowledge and map towards, you know, various state standards like the New York state or federal standards and those sorts of things. I then kind of moved over to run operations for, for a company called FishMe, uh, got acquired and, and became a company called CoFence. Had to take some time off um, as part of a non-compete and then came over to cloud conformity with, uh, with Trend Micro. Personally, I am a endurance athlete. So, I spend a lot of time training um, in the early mornings or, or, or late nights. So this whole like shut in thing is, is kind of like my normal life. You, you, I, I work out in the dark, I work all day and then I go to sleep early. And so a, a lot of the things that people have been complaining about, like a, I don't do anything on a Friday night. I mean, I'm, I'm usually in bed at eight thirty, nine o'clock on a Friday night anyway, because I have to get up and train the next morning um, at, at five, five thirty in the morning. So, not a lot of differences for me. I think for my family and for a lot of other people, there's um, there's, there's there's quite a big difference. Um, but uh, let's get into kind of kind of what and how and why we're here. I, I think the the real summary of, of why we're here is that is just that that focal point over on on the right here, right? AWS 2019 Technology Partner of the Year. Now, now what that says is we took the time to understand what was happening with respect to AWS with respect to its adoption, with respect to its usage, with respect to how, how technologies best leveraged it. And we implemented a technology based off of that. 
And we did it so well that, that we were recognized and acknowledged by and by AWS to do it. So we built a company um, and, and we, we got acquired to do it. But let's, let's get and talk to, to what we see and, and how we see it. And this isn't a product pitch or anything like that. So what we see is kind of threefold. We see, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, as you're beginning or commencing your migration to the cloud, we see three things. We see, you, we see a group of people that are a third kind of in the beginning or the genesis of their migration. They think, okay, this, you know, AWS has been around since 2006, right? So it's not, not new by many standards, but there are people that, and companies and technologies that haven't adopted it. So we see customers or, or people that, that are coming and saying, hey, we are want, wanting to adopt, adapt, and implement cloud in our environment. So we want to figure out what this is. We want to figure out how it works. We want to use AWS. We want to we want to leverage it. Uh, let's 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 begin, you know, discovery on this. We see people who are, have have kind of already done that and are in the midst of the migration or in a hybrid migration. So yes, we have some applications, some workloads, some presence in the cloud. Maybe it's 50/50. Maybe it's 60/40. Whatever it is but we're going to keep some things kind of on our own on-prem sort of thing. Fine. Totally, you know, another third of, of the people that we see, or we see a group of people that are like, nope, we're all in, everything's being developed, everything's being hosted, everything's, you know, run in the cloud. And what I'm going to focus on, so if you go back to me, um, you can see the, well, you can't, I guess I didn't put the title there. If I had put the titles that I had there, you can look at my LinkedIn page. Um, my my profile was more application security. Um, so what I'm going to focus on is kind of the development process and the development life cycle as it relates to to how and what we're seeing with with adoption with AWS. And so odds are your company fits into one of these three buckets. I, I have yet to come across somebody that's not in one of these three. Um, even if somebody says, no, 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 we'll never go cloud, they've at least thought about uh, uh, or had a, a, a scope project that, that looked at a, mig a migration to AWS. So it's no secret, I mean, if you were at reInvent last year, before all the, the, the craziness and madness that, that, that came with, with COVID, um, you would have seen the announcement of new services that were launched. You would have seen the heavy spike in in services that that have come out just in the last year you know i think in 2006 it launched with a handful of services now and even up until 2013 2014 they didn't have a lot of services that that were there now you know we're, we're triple quadruple you know 5x that with more on the way and more being delivered you know kind of with every conference so it, it's no secret that there's this exploding set of of cloud infrastructure that's available it's no secret that, that AWS has put a lot of resources and a lot of technology, good technology, kind of behind it. And it's no secret that, that it's helpful. And, and the reason you're part of this user group is because you've adopted AWS as part of your daily work life and as part of the value that it brings to your, to your company and to, to, your, to your products. So let's talk a little bit about, okay, fine. You know, we've got this thing. It's out there. We want to adopt it. Um, it's this technology. We might not completely understand it, or maybe you know, in this in this audience, you know, you're the you're the subject matter experts at your companies, and you you completely understand it. But but odds are your boss or your 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 peers or other people within your institution don't completely understand it. Let's talk about some of the best practices that we wanted to 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 teach you, so that when you're on this this road or this journey, um, you, you're doing it right, right. And so why can we say it well? Um, you know, our, like I said, our product, our, our company was built, <laughs> literally built off of the well architecture framework, right? And, and well architecture review process. So, so when I'm talking about this, I'll, 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 sh I'll, I'll point back to, to some of the, the components of this. But the key to this, to this framework it goes back to what we'll talk about next, which is the shared responsibility model. And what we mean by that, so this is a set of best practices that allows you to map to a standard that is common among any company 
but is the best practices among all of the company. So, I mean, if I were to ask a question, I don't know if somebody wants to throw it in chat there. How many customers, how many, how many people, businesses does AWS have? Just throw a number out there in the chat or, or if you want to talk, um, just talk, but just, just in general, how many businesses do we think AWS has? Is it in the thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions of, of companies that are using AWS's services today globally? Millions. Okay, Justin thinks millions. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and that's where we're going, right? So millions, right? We're talking from small businesses to huge, huge, large Fortune 10, Fortune 5 companies are utilizing this. That's a lot of data, okay? That's a lot of information. That's a lot of customers that, that AWS has access to. And what do they do with that? They take that and they say, look, yeah, you know, mobile app development company over here and healthcare over here and financial services over here and energy company over here. They're all doing different things, but they're all doing a certain set of things commonly. Let's look at those certain set of things commonly that they're doing and put together this framework for them to implement a best set of practices. So sure, you might be a water bottling company in, in somewhere in Alabama. You might be a healthcare somewhere else. You might be a mobile, completely, completely virtual company that's developing something specific elsewhere. But there are some common traits and some common characteristics among everything that you're doing that we want to do, and thus comes the Well-Architected Framework. So as you know, there's five pillars to the Well-Architected Framework. We'll go over each of those pillars here. But what it's meant to do is map back to the best practices that completely make your implementation and your component or your application that you do go well. So the Well Architected Framework, we've got a little report that, that, we, that we can pump out that, that maps back kind of, kind of to it. Uh, the, the point is when you look at it, you see a set of checks, right? There are various domains to it, and then there are various questions, like how do you design your workload so that you can understand its state, right? And so obviously we, we go through and scan and tell you that, but, but the point is there are these basic checks that need to be done for any customer, for any person that's utilizing AWS. You've got to have understand encryption. You've got to understand storage. You've got to understand compute. You've got to do identity and access management a particular way. You've got to do encryption a particular way. You've got to handle secrets a particular way, right? It doesn't matter what company you are. You've got to do those things correctly, and you've got to do them well. And so when you map those back to the Well Architecture Framework and you use that as sort of your baseline, to build something off of, you're doing all right. Now, can you go steps further? Absolutely. You can do, you know, compliance that's tied to a SOC 2, NIST 800, uh, NIST Cyber, CIS Top 20 Benchmarks. You can get granular. You can do something that's specific to HIPAA High Trust. You can get some, something that's specific to, you know, Energy Sec, ICS SCADA stuff. Sure, absolutely, yes. But you have to start with this baseline and you have to do it with this in mind because this is the recommended best practices that are that are said by somebody that has purview into millions of implementations of their technology they know firsthand what works and what doesn't and when you build off of the well architected framework and you map to those five pillars used to be four now it's five when you map to those five pillars you're going to have a good experience and you're going to have a well, <laughs> I'm using the term in the definition, a well, I was going to say well architected. I'm not going to say that. But you're going to have a, a positive functioning experience with the application and the environment that you're building out in, in the, 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 the cloud or in AWS. So let's talk about kind of how this is done, right? So we know and we understand, you know, CICD and development pipelines. We know and we understand agile methodology and agile delivery of products. Um, for the most part, most of the people on this call probably have releases that happen weekly at, at most, maybe daily, maybe hourly. Um, 
so you're constantly doing these builds and you're constantly, constantly, you know, kind of developing and creating this environment. First thing to discuss here, most of the people that are doing the development, remember I said that you as the people on this call are the subject matter experts. So the peers or the developers that are submitting their code to the repository, um, to the integrated development environment, to whatever it is, GitHub, to wherever you're using it, probably don't have the security, the operational excellence, the reliability, the, the, the experience that you do as it relates to, to AWS. They might have been taught a certain amount of things, sure. They might have been taught how to develop in a certain language, great. But they weren't taught how to develop in that language with these things in mind, the well-architected framework or AWS's best presentation practices as suggested. So when they start to develop and when they start to build, there's already a gap, right? Now you might try to mitigate this gap with infrastructure as code templates, right? You go and you drop a Terraform template, you go and you drop a CloudFormation template in their environment, and you're like, hey, hey, use this. Use this template when you're when you're doing development. That helps, but certainly as you do nested templates and you get more and more complex with the with the the, the templates, and you have consultant services, Tata consultant services coming from in from India, and so and so services coming from Seattle, and so and so consultancy shop out of of you know somewhere within the region. You've got some differences in, in in scope and ability. So there's a lot of dynamic development happening. And this dynamic development is all happening at high velocity and you're moving stuff on your Kanban and you're trying to get things developed as quickly, as quickly as possible. Release, release, release. Pressure, pressure, pressure. Shadow IT organization from marketing that's just spinning up their own AWS instance and just like, holy cow, what are they doing? Where did they get an account from? Who's paying for that AWS bill? You know, all sorts of stuff just happening all, all over the place within your environment. Great. You can see where I'm going with this, right? Submit their code. What happens, you get something that's misconfigured, right? You get something that, that is an issue. You get a, possibly a vulnerability. You get possibly a data leak. You get possibly some bad things, right? But there's all this complexity that's happening in your development life cycle, and it's all under a good pretense, right? We want to get a product out to the customer. We want to make something customer-facing. We want to make something that, that's, that's good and functional and, and always, always up to date all a great reason and all, all a, you know, a very valid pretense, but leads to a lot of issues and a lot of confusion. So what do you do? Well, you've got to develop and maintain. And, and so, you know, you've got your confirmation templates issued. You've got access issues as it relates to con your container. You've got issues that are tied to <laughs> somebody not uh, properly understanding how storage works and how to encrypt or protect data from, from a storage standpoint. You've got issues that are that are tied to you know PKI um, and and all that sort of thing just just compounds right and 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 takes out takes takes you to a place of failure right and takes you to a place where you you've got a misconfigured environment and gets you to a place where you're not not utilizing or understanding best practices if you get to the beginning of this life cycle right I'm going to use my laser pointer here. If you go over here, and hopefully you can all see where I'm, where here is, I'm under the development where those little developers or people are. Um, if you go over here, right, this is where you can fix things easily. We, we use an analogy when we're talking to somebody um, about, you know, cars or, or, or something being manufactured, right, an assembly line. If you're assembling a car and you make a mistake, but you can't correct the mistake till it rolls off the assembly line. Let's say you got to change a screw. You're assembling this car. You realize that as the car rolls off the assembly line, oh crap, we got to replace this screw. It's going to cost you a lot of money to replace a million screws. It's going to cost you a lot of time. And it's going to be, you know, a lot of resources and a lot of public humiliation for the fact that you have to go now fix this screw in this car that's almost completely that, that is completely done. But you got to fix one thing. Whereas if you fix that screw, when the screw was being put in, right, you're much, much more accessible, much, much more efficient, and you're taking care of the problem uh, on every other car that comes through that assembly line. Here's the right screw to use. Here's how you fix it. <laughs> I never thought I'd say this. The well-architected framework is that screw, right? Or at least it's the process that delivers or gives you that screw. It's the ability to go through and say, hey, you're doing something wrong at the beginning. We want you to do, take care, maintain, fix, and, t and be responsible for this 
all the way at the at the beginning of this, so that when it gets over here, you're you're, you're secure, you're taken care of, and 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 you're well made. So so how do you build off of that? Well, by now you're you're well familiar with the shared responsibility model. This is actually you know not something that's foreign to even people that that don't or haven't adopted AWS. Um, you 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 have this in you know co-located data center environments or even like your own hosted data center environment, right? You've got a network team or a, a data center team that's responsible for the stuff in orange, and then you have an application team and a middleware team that's responsible for the stuff in blue. Internally to your your bank, your hospital, whatever, there's somebody that orders that server that you rack that they rack up, plug in, right? And then there's somebody else that comes and installs the operating system. There's somebody else that comes and installs the networking layer, and there's somebody else that verifies the hardening of that server. And then you come in and design the application that lives on that. Same sort of responsibility model that that that's that tied within within AWS and their and cloud computing, right? AWS is responsible for that infrastructure piece, right? To compute the storage, the database, the services, the networking, the monitoring, the, the, the global infrastructure that they provide as part of this. You're responsible for building all the things on top of that, right? And, and, I, and I sometimes liken this back to the old days of the OSI model, the Open Systems Interface model, where you had layer, layer zero to layer seven with layer eight being the human and you had you know, kind of the physical all the way to the logical. I mean, it's very similar here. You know, you, you've got... You've got certain things that you have to do, and you've got certain things that are provided. But but they they while it's all vir in a virtualized environment, we still need you know compute, we still need storage, we still need database, we still need networking as part of that. So that model you know kind of likens itself very well. But you know it's not AWS's responsibility to take care of your firewall configuration. It's not AWS's responsibility to take care of your identity and access management. It's not AWS's responsibility to talk to you about your customer data. Right, that's yours. But they sure as heck can tell you how to do it correctly, and they sure as hell can tech, sure as heck can tell you how to configure it properly, right? And that's where we go and, and sort of talk about why and how the Well Architecture Framework is valuable. So there's there are five pillars to it, right? And they cover everything from security all the way over to operational excellence. We have a heavy, heavy expertise kind of in security um, because we were focused on kind of security and compliance. And there are some components of the well architecture framework that cut across everything, right? So while identity access management may be something that's that's particularly and only security facing, tagging is a best practice that cuts across everything and every part of, of this organization, uh, every part of this, right? So tagging is a best practice that, that you want to implement across everything, right? And that does cover security and that is on reliability before consistency and so on. So, you know, when it comes and when you're looking at the various pillars or components of the well-architected framework, it is best to go through and understand that while there are best practices that are unique to, to some individual, there are certainly and most assuredly um, components that come across everything. And just as perfect as every conference call goes, uh, a dog has barked in the background. So this is this is par for the course. Bingo, right? So let's talk about you know how we go through and check that. We go through and specifically allow you to take a look at a check by check basis. Now, I'm not talking about a product here. What I'm talking about is this knowledge base. What I want you to do, and, and one of the takeaways that, that we'll have for you is the free and completely available with no charge knowledge base that you can go out to and check against the components of the Well-Architected Framework and the Well-Architected Review. So we've got more checks than are just in the AWS Well Architecture Framework, but um, we've we've got them out there totally public sized and available for you to go see them. And so the 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 war the Well Architecture Review I think is at 326 or 336 of, of some of our rules. But the point is, um, if you want to know how to properly config configure you know S3 bucket encryption. If you want to know on how to do um, 45 day key rotation policies, you can go out to our website and you can get that information completely community driven, completely free, no, no, 
dollars need to be exchanged. And, and I know that's what this user group and, and this, the meetup circle and community is about. And that's, that's one of the reasons why we're here, right? We, we give back to the community and we believe that this is a community driven problem. And we have active community members that, that give us um, up to date information and that, that test us against, you know, something that, that, that we put out there. So if you don't get anything out of today, other than than one thing, get that knowledge base and I'm sorry, I moved the slide forward, but get that knowledge base and, and take that and, and go out there and look at the step by step remediation guides that we provide for you um, as part of, of, you know, just our, our community um, that, that, that we give. So take a look at that. Take a look at the knowledge base. Take some time just to, just to look at that. We also understand and want you to, to think about things that are happening instantly, right? As every second goes by, your, your AWS environment is changing. Might not be you that changes it. Might be a developer, might be another team, might be that marketing department or, or somebody somewhere else that's doing that. But the point is there's, there's complete, there's, there is a, a dynamic and, and constantly changing environment that needs to be completely monitored. Um, so you want to be certain that you've got something and, and are utilizing something that, that is taking care of that. And then you want to make certain that you integrate, right? So if I go back, way, 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 way back to here, right? You develop a particular way and you, you know, maybe have your developers coding locally, submitting to a, a centralized repository, a build gets done or promoted, nobody wants to break the build, you're using JIRA tickets to, to do this, this the, any, any bugs or any feature requests that, that are requested as part of your builds, your, your build coordinators are doing the monitoring of those, those requests via JIRA tickets, fine, right? That's, that's, that's how you develop and that's how you should do things. Replace JIRA with ServiceNow or, or PagerDuty or Slack or whatever, you can use chat ops regardless. That's how you do your development, great. How welcome do you think you or your teams or your company would be for me to come along and say, whoa, 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 I want to put a, a check, um, a, a gate right here that, or right here that, that, that just stops everything and scans and, you know, remember the old static and dynamic code analysis tools that, that were out there um, a decade, two decades ago um, that, that did all this. How well do you think um, your team would respond to that or your company? right? You're slowing down the velocity of the build. Not well at all, right? Nobody would. It's a rhetorical question. So what you want to do and the way that you want to do this and the way that we do it is that is completely integrate with this process. So here's the second piece or the second takeaway that I have for you for 2020. While you're sitting at home and COVID, you know, isolation and sequestering yourself, I want you to have 2020 be the year that you take the onus of security off of yourself and put it on the developers, but don't tell them that you're putting it on the developers. Don't call it security. Don't call it, you know, a check, call it a bug, speak in their language and put the onus back on them to fix it. And here's what I mean. Build something, you know, obviously we fit in here, but build something to where any sort of security related or compliance related or well architected framework related violation simply gets reported to a developer as a bug. So you go through, you know, you've got us doing a scan or, or, or you're doing the well architected review checks, right? Wherever, wherever this is happening, you find an issue, right? A developer has, has got their, their keys that, that aren't being rotated every 45 days or some the identity and access management issue or something like that. You send it back to the developer, but you send it back by a JIRA ticket, right? And the build coordinator is monitoring this and is like, oh, this is a ticket. Oh, this needs to be taken care of. Hey, you know, Sally, what are you doing to fix this? And Sally's like, oh, I, I, better, I better fix this JIRA ticket. Squash this bug. Tibbity, tibbity type, fix, 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 remediate, boom taken care of all the steps to remediate it or, you know, in that, that knowledge base that I sent you, but, or that I told you to go to, but regardless, now build coordinator sees it, says, ah, this is great, submits it, ticket bug is squashed, ticket is remediated, build proceeds is not broken. All of that was security and compliance and well-architected related, right? But you didn't get involved and 
it was totally handled by the via a development practice right so when i talk about the integration right we you want to implement and 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 maintain something that doesn't break the build doesn't in, interfere with the, the velocity of development and doesn't even let the developer know that what you're doing is aligning to the well executed framework and that what you're doing is aligning to the best practices of, of some sort of, of of development methodology. You're just letting them develop the way that they develop. They're squashing bugs, they're submitting tickets, they're fixing tickets, they're remediating findings, and they're moving forward. And that's what you want to get to, and that's what you want to do. And you can even do it, you know, plus plus past past and over and above and beyond the well architected framework. You can do it, you know, for compliance standards and, and compliance frameworks and, and those sorts of things. So you look at the the sort of life cycle, right? The customers are a third, a third, a third. They're beginning their journey. They're in the midst of their journey and are in a hybrid model or they're, they're all in on the cloud, right? They typically, though, when they want to adopt this, obviously, they're, they're in AWS, right? They're not, they have to adopt the well-executed framework for that, for that component. Um, there's they're some sort of digital or SaaS-related business. There's sensitive data that's being put out there. There's cloud, cloud architect, cloud security, you know, security architect, those sorts of things as, as part of them. And they've got some spend. They're, they're putting dollars into AWS. It's tied to this. And if you meet or, or any or all of these things, um, you, you're, you're a great candidate to adopt the well-architected framework, and you're a great candidate to adopt you know, an understanding or a better understanding or a deeper understanding of the shared responsibility model. And so you know, you've seen this infinite diagram and, and, and this sort of thing. The, the, the point behind this is, is is kind of back here right you you want to get to the point where you are completely integrated and you want to get to the point where you are taking and in and weaving in your compliance and your framework standardization to the well architecture process just as part of their their every everyday delivery thing um, remember you know if you've got one piece of homework it's, it's go out here and go to the knowledge base and just grab and th this will improve your life. Like right? this will literally help you from your AWS development standpoint, because it's a, it's a set of checks and a set of instructions, step by step, line by line, precept by precept, to help you be able to config the top 70 plus services with 600 different checks. So that, that's a part of that. Um, so I've been doing a lot of talking here. Um, questions, comments, observations. I don't know who I need to pass this back to, but. Um, you can just leave that up. Can here. pass control back. Okay. Okay. No, you can leave that up. Um, yeah. So I have a question actually. Um, this sounds like a very esoteric topic. It sounds like there's ways to be wrong. Is there a right, or is that just up to the business and their posture? No. There, there's definitely a way to be wrong, and there's definitely a way to be right. Um, like I said, the 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 analysis that AWS has done across millions of people um, puts together that, that best practices framework. So if I go back to this slide right here, right? They're, they're telling you, look, these are the, these are the five things with, with a component underneath each of these things that you need to do, right? And if you're not doing these, um, and if you don't have a way to figure out if you're doing these correctly, um, you're going to be wrong. Right? And you're going to get to the point where you, you've got a misconfiguration or, you, you know, even worse, you've got a breach of some, of some kind or, you know, you've just got a poorly performing, inefficient, expensive app that's costing you thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars a year because you didn't map it correctly, because you've got idle instances, because you've got, you know, storage and compute configured incorrectly. So there's definitely, definitely a wrong. Want to open it up to anybody else? Questions? Put them in the chat or just bring yourself off mute. Well, I am here and, and certainly available. You know, you're here, um, Justin, the, the, the team is here. You know, anything, anything that you want to, to ask or, or, you know, if you're watching this recorded, if you're watching this recorded, um, feel free to reach out and you know, we'd be glad to support and help walk you through this. Okay.
curious, does anybody want to share like maybe some personal uh, anecdotes for how they've kind of dealt with the working with development teams? I, I, I really am not too uh, familiar with who our audience is exactly, uh, but I'd just like if anybody wants to share some personal anecdotes. Personal anecdotes related to what particular? Um, just like dealing, like uh, first of all, I mean, like I, I'd like to know who, where, where your perspective is coming from, as far as like I, which, I guess, which team uh, you're a part of. If you're coming from like the more security focused side or the development side, or like I mean, just kind of how that dichotomy works within, um, I guess, an organization. It seems kind of like a. At sometimes at odds, sometimes in great synergy, but sometimes, you know, there's a lot of things that people aren't wanting to communicate properly. Like there's a lot of ways to kind of skin that cat. Um, so yeah, just wanted to get some more information. Yeah, it's definitely a, a, a mixed bag. <laughs> I, I run a development team and then uh, Jeff Clark, I believe is on here. He's our security compliance officer. Oh, he just dropped. Um, and we're very much in the process of figuring out how to integrate them into our dev process okay They've very much been outside of it up to this point mm. that's one of my my big long-term goals for the year okay and uh so like i mean uh, what kind of challenges are you experiencing whenever you're trying to integrate these two teams well up to this point we've been trying to find the actual information about what we need to do we've um not had to be in in the SOC world uh, for our aws portion of things and that's changing this year um mm. Our application handles financial data. Uh, not a lot of PMI and you know, personal identifying information, but um, it does have, you know, accounts and all in there. Um, so we're working with with security. We've done a, a mock security audit for AWS, and we're going through the results of that now, and using that to drive what's going to be our security policy for the rest of the year. Um, mostly, I mean, a lot of it's real simple stuff at this point: locking down accounts and making sure access is, is correct and keys are rotated. Um, getting into secrets manager trying to started using a guard duty was a new process they added which uh, i've liked uh for analyzing flow logs and okay. uh, that's been good for finding some information but um yeah the whole app. no i don't think i have anything particular right now it's been it's just been a challenge the the integration is there isn't any Dello developers don't like security and yeah. i you know the, the takeaway is you know like you said make that a bug instead of a separate task it's just part of what you're doing um, mm -hmm. and that's that's definitely something i think we can take and use cool cool yeah i, th I thought that was a pretty cool little uh, uh i guess outlook on things too addressing it as a bug versus yeah. something else. Oh. and i guess one i guess one question i would have is, is overall how much uh access do development teams typically have to the actual aws environment itself um we're to the point where I'm beginning to lock that down mm -hmm. a lot. Previously, they had uh, at least one or two developers had uh, quite a bit of access. Um, and now I'm moving all theirs off to a separate account and mm -hmm. just separate from the prod and staging environments. And, um, okay. you know, they don't really have input on that anymore. So is that fairly typical or, or do developers tend to get more involved in the, uh, the DevOps portion of things or, you know, that segregation is, is absolutely where where the best practices seem to be heading, right? Because you don't want to get it to the point where you're you're bringing down or, or having a misconfigured environment that, that's brushed up to a production stand, standpoint. Definitely. So I guess I'll, I'll throw that question back to you. Um, so you know, we talked about, you know, guard duty, control tower, Macy, those sorts of services that are all native and actually stuff that we ingest. Um, and, and we love to see people utilizing. Um, how do you believe in sandbox environments being completely unmonitored and just, you know, kind of on their own? Or do you believe that sandbox environments should have some sort of control or, or, or insight into them? Um, I don't think you can have anything completely unmonitored. Uh, you know, we may not, in a sandbox or, you know, in dev environments and test environments, we may not have real data in there, but... I mean, that's still real code. And if you had a breach there, uh, even a separate AWS account, uh, 
getting getting breached on that one account, yeah, I, I couldn't see leaving it completely unmonitored. We're definitely not doing a lot there, uh, but I, I do have guard duty at, at the very least set up to monitor for for access issues on those uh, environments. But I don't I don't know how much would you typically dive into that because obviously you don't want to spend a lot of time or extra money on a sandbox, but. Yeah, so we we kind of see the the the, the camp split fifty fifty. We have we have a lot of people that say, nope. You know, the whole point of that sandbox is to not not um, you know not give them any controls and just to let them develop it. And then the other thing is, well, look, they're they're doing the development in the sandbox environment, and it's eventually making it to non prod staging, you know, dev test. So why don't we, you know? deal with that screw right at the beginning, right? Right sort of thing. The answer is cost, right? There, there's a cost that comes with the compliance that, that you're putting in, in those sorts of environments. Um, but, uh, you know, we deal with it in a very creative way. Uh, not going to get into that, but, but, you know, from your standpoint and your, your usage, uh, my take on it is, you know, get that visibility as sooner, as early in the development cycle as, as, as possible. Right. Oh, well, that makes sense. I guess I'm getting some used to having that there and then having that monitor level. Okay. Awesome. Good stuff, guys. Yeah, so that's, that's the route we've been going as well. So all of our dev accounts have, um, devs have sandboxed access into them or very limited access, and then they have to put tickets in with like, hey, we're going to deploy this thing, and we just iterate through the bugs of what doesn't work in order to get the permissions right in Terraform, and then we take it to prod, we know what permissions are needed and whatnot. It's worked a lot better from the support standpoint. Nice. Awesome. Yes. Yeah, thank you for sharing, David, and thank you for sharing, Edward. Thank you.